headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He's also the co-host of the Smart Money Happy Hour with Richard Cruz, a very popular podcast that's kind of exploding out there. It's a really big deal. So we're here with you to help you today. The phone number is 888-825-5225. We're going to start this hour with Teray in Houston. Hey, Teray, what's up? Hi, Teray. How are you? Or We lost her. Maybe we're Off not. to a great start. Maybe we're not. Okay. <laughs> we'll try again. Let's see if I can do that one more time. Uh, Teray, are you there? Okay. All right. All right. We're just going to start with that then. Eric is in Albany. Hi, Eric. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your taking my taking my question. Sure. What's up? So, I I I, I keep getting into my head and wanting to liquidate all my investments and pay off my mortgage. Um, and I, I I kind of know that like mathematically that's probably not the right choice, but like I feel like it would be major pressure reliever and then to be able to go back through and just use all my discretionary cash to start going back in and, and rebuilding my portfolio. Mm-hmm. So how much do you have in uh, your portfolio? Uh, I have uh, my stock portfolio. I have where's, uh, $180,000. Did you say 180 or did you say 80? One hundred and eighty thousand. Okay, and what's your mortgage balance? My mortgage balance is like one hundred and seventy. Okay, all right. And those are the the portfolio you're discussing is not in a retirement account, correct? Yeah, it's a taxable account. Yeah. Okay, and you're debt free other than your home? Yeah, for the most part, I have I you know I have a credit card that's got a very low balance on it that I literally just charged last month that I get paid off by the end of the month. Okay, and what's your household income? Uh, pre tax about two hundred and sixty. Good for you. Well done. How old are you? I'm forty. Okay. And so, uh, the, so you're saying that mathematically it doesn't make sense, and I would even challenge that part. I think mathematically it does make sense to pay off your house. Um, well, we bought we bought my house in two thousand and twelve. Doesn't matter. And um, we we got we got like three and a half percent interest on it. So at this point, and we've overpaid on it ever since, and, and paid biweekly. Yeah. And so at this point, I'm like not really paying any any interest on it, and what interest I am paying is is minimal um, versus the returns that I've been able to get in the stock market. Yeah. Um, you know, but you've not factored in risk. Right. There's no math for risk in your formula. And not factoring in risk mathematically is a naive formula. Mm-hmm. And um, so here's what we know. We know from the data of studying millionaires that the typical millionaire does two things that causes them to get to their first one to five million dollars, that they get out of debt, house and everything, and they build their 401k and their Roth IRAs and good growth stock mutual funds. The number of millionaires that we asked that said, and we said, okay, did you leverage your home in order to invest in stocks and that's why you became a millionaire? The number of them that say that is very close to zero. They say stuff like, well, Lord, no, I got out of debt. Isn't that interesting? So the formula that you're proposing is mathematically correct, um, is not used by hardly any millionaires to get to millionaire status. Translation, your formula is wrong. So, Eric, would you take out, against your home, a $180,000 loan to invest into single stocks? Um, well, be, you know, if, it, if, if, if that were all I was doing for, for a living, yeah, sure, why not? But If you were day trading um, for a living, basically? 
Uh, yeah. Um, I, you also I, probably I, wouldn't be sleeping at night. You'd lose relationships because you'd be staring at these numbers, making sure they no, go up all the time. You're, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right about that. So there's a piece of this where, wonder. man, I can feel that you're craving that piece, but you're stuck on the starry eyed. But what if I got this return on that money? Yeah. And the guaranteed return in your house, I think, is way more valuable. So here's what I would do. You called us. And so I, and really, really simply, I would cash out the stock and pay off the house today. Now, then I don't have a house payment. I have an increased stability at the very foundation of my life and my financial plan. Because I, you, you cannot grasp and you actually can't mathematically capture that it feels different to walk through your backyard with no shoes on. The grass feels different when you don't have a mortgage. You cannot capture that. You cannot capture what this does, it, that the stress release, even if it's minor, what that does for your relationships. You cannot capture what it does for your boldness and your excellence in your career. Uh, and all of those things over time, the math actually plays out that people of means, people of wealth, actually do not take out home mortgages to trade and sell, buy and sell single stocks. Those are called day traders, 78% of which lose money and um, lose a lot of other things while they're doing it. So George, you only hear that, about the ones that win. And so, well, and, you, and they're always temporary because, you know, it's the same thing as playing the slots. Oh, I won at the slots, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how they built those casinos, okay? Not by you winning at the slots, I can tell you that. So mathematically, just because you hit it once doesn't mean you're going to – so all of that to say, Eric – I'm going off the data of the 30 years of doing what I do, walking alongside people, watching their lives transform, watching their relationships, their careers blossom, uh, and their portfolio. Because when you don't have a house payment and you make $260,000 a year, you can build up $180,000 really quick if you want to screw around with single stocks. Won't take long at all. So good question. Thank you for calling. Pay off your house today, sir. Yeah, the whole end goal of both of our discussions is build wealth. The question is, what is the best path to do it? And we have found that doing it with the least amount of risk possible puts you in a better financial position long term. And so what we're saying here is you're going to build wealth either way. You could lose your butt hanging on to these single stocks in the next week, depending on who tweets what. Or you could have a guaranteed return with no house payment, making $260,000 you think you can build wealth with that situation? Absolutely. A hundred percent of the time you can. So, uh, and a hundred percent of the foreclosures occur on a home with a mortgage. So. <laughs> Didn't have to do a lot of research it, on that It'll one. come to you later, I promise. Uh, so that's the idea, folks. That's the idea. What is your most powerful wealth building tool? Is it your home equity? Nope. It's your income. The person in your mirror is the secret sauce. For you to build wealth, for you to build a quality life, you're the secret sauce. You're the answer. No one's going to do it for you. And there is no magic pill that you've yet to discover. Just go, go in there, brush the fog off of the mirror after the shower and look at that guy, look at that gal and go, you're the problem. You're the solution. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. 
Visit Blinds.com to save up to 45% off everything site-wide. Go to Blinds.com now to learn more. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Well, a lot has changed over the years here on the Ramsey Show, but our practical advice on life and money never has, I can tell you that. For over 30 years, millions and millions of folks have tuned into the Ramsey Show for money, relationships, career, and life advice. And whether people are up to their eyeballs in debt and wondering how they can't get ahead or they are uh, spending their days in a dead-end J-O-B and trying to find hope, Trying to find a way. Well, we're excited to announce that the Ramsey Show is now also on TBN. And you can tune into the Ramsey Show on TBN weekdays at 5 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. Central. Get your daily dose of life, money, career, and relationship advice. Hey, be sure and jump in there. We'll see you then. George Campbell, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. And I think we've got Tere in Houston lined up now. Hey, Tere, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Better than we deserve. What's up? Well, thank you guys for taking my call to start. Um, so basically, I purchased a home, my first home, back in October, and I am now experiencing buyer's remorse. It's just been a lot of, if it's nothing, it's something. Everything's broken. Everything needs to be fixed. Everything needs to be replaced. Um, and so I guess my question is, if I did not make the best decision, how do I make the best decision moving forward in rectifying, controlling, and maintaining my financial responsibilities to build and so forth. So is this a fixer-upper that you bought? Like, are, are these shocking repairs, or do you know some of this going in? No. Um, it Basically, the, it's a house that was built in 83, and a lot of the renovations that were done were poorly done. Okay. And this buyer's remorse, is this coming from the mortgage payment being too big, or is it all these repairs that you don't have the cash to do? Where is that coming from? Both. Both. I feel like I'm paying too much on my mortgage for all of the repairs that I'm ending up having to take care of now that I've moved in. Hmm. So how much is your house payment? Um, right now I'm paying 1865 Okay. And what's your take-home pay a month? A month, 74 Okay. Your house payment's not too high. Okay. So that's not a problem. You're just not used to paying a house payment yet, okay? But it, it's it's in the zone of it's it's less than a fourth of your take home pay, so you're fine. What do you do for a living, Teray? I recruit for oil and gas. Good for you. Okay. Well, um, what uh, what I think is going to happen is um, that you're probably going to get the other side of the bulk of these repairs. I don't know what exactly you've had to fix or do. What, what, what are some examples of the three biggest, most worrisome things that, and the cost of them that you had to fool with? Um, one, of the, one of the things I have not started working on, but it is something that is being told that I need to start planning, is the roof. Mm -hmm. um, as well, the majority of the appliances that look to be new are having to be replaced. Um, insulation is completely poor. I have to have someone to come in and look at that. So those, those right now are just a few of the things that I'm trying to work on. Okay. Who told you that the roof had to be replaced? Um, at the time when I first moved in, um, I did use my VA home loan. So the inspector that the VA sent out, um, he was very particular about the roof. And that was a major concern when it came to, you know, finalizing the purchase. It wasn't a concern enough that the VA appraiser required a roof right if it was bad va would have required a roof or they wouldn't have put the loan on it okay so now who told you there's it needs a roof is it leaking um we had a a technician come out during christmas because the ac was a problem and he told me that it was it was leaking around somewhere in the attic which was causing mold or some sort, and he was just like, it's not major, but it is something that I wanted to look into. I'm very, um, I'm an overthinker. Um, this, like I said, this is my first home. I'm new to all of this, so yeah. I, I'm panicking right now, yeah. and I'm just trying to stay on top of everything. Yeah. 
So you're a self-admitting that you're catastrophizing. Okay. The guy <laughs> went up there. So. The guy went up there and he said, "There's a leak and a little bit of mold. You need to get that looked at." And you went, "I gotta get a whole roof." <laughs> right. Possibly so. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's what I heard. I might be wrong, and I, I do that too. That's how I can recognize it. So um, we all have a drama queen that lives inside of us. Every one of us. And <laughs> part part of making good decisions, you ask how to make good decisions, is to tell the drama queen to shut up. Um, and that you know that's part of it. You you got to look at yourself and go, you're, you're, you're really come on. So yeah, you probably do need to get that roof looked at, but it might be a few hundred dollars instead of ten thousand to put on an entire roof. It might need a little bit of uh, re shingle replacement there, or there might be a leak around one of the vents, and they put a new boot on it and caulk it up, and you're just fine. So a good handyman getting up there and fixing that one area and, you know, shooting some stuff, killing the mold in that one little area uh, so it doesn't get worse, and you don't go up there later and the whole attic has grown full or something like that. So, yeah, address it, but don't over think it and, and then you know all of the appliances need look new but need to be replaced are they not working absolutely not what's I not working the, your dishwasher doesn't work no dishwasher stove refrigerator nothing the, none of them work no did the inspector catch any of this no did you have That's a home inspection part. i even i Yes, I had two home inspections, and I had a gas leak that was so extreme, I couldn't stay in my house for two days, and I didn't know, like, how I asked, how did y'all miss this? Mm-hmm. Okay, so your home inspector is an idiot. Okay. <laughs> yeah, obviously, right? I mean, you miss a gas leak yes. and and appliances yes. that don't work? That's a basic thing. You go through mm -hmm. and turn on all the appliances. It's, it's basic home inspection stuff. Okay, so... The great news is you make good money. Your house payment's not out of control. You probably don't need an entire roof. You do need a new dishwasher. Uh, have you asked appliance repair people to come and just repair the existing ones, or are you just planning to replace them completely? Um, I was trying to see if I had some type of ability through my homeowner's insurance, um, if that could be rectified with them. Um, no. It's not. No. So I'm going to have to pay. Homeowner's insurance doesn't it. cover your dishwasher not working. So just have a guy come out and either look at it and fix it or replace it. A few hundred bucks. I mean, they're not they're not ten thousand dollars. Do you have any other debt, Tere? Um, outside of my a little credit card debt and a few thousand old on my car. No, that's it. Okay, and when it comes, you said we. Do you have a spouse involved here? Uh, did I say we? I do apologize. Okay. okay. It's just you? You're single. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> here's what I want you to do. Uh, what's happening is all of these things are up flying around and, and, and at just about the time you wake up in the morning or about the time you're about to doze off at night, they're overwhelming. Instead, what I want you to do is just write down a list of what needs to be repaired and what you're going to do about it. Okay. So, okay. Dishwasher. I'm going to call a repairman. And if it can't be repaired cheaply, I'm going to replace it. Refrigerator. I'm going to call a repairman. If it can't be re repaired cheaply, I'm going to replace it. Roof. I'm going to have a handyman type come out, not a roofer trying to sell me a roof, that just looks at it, finds the one little leak, fixes the one little leak, and sprays some stuff and kills the mold. Okay? And you just you, you develop a list with an action plan. And when the weird thing is if you'll write it down literally on a yellow pad, a little repair to-do list then you're going to look at it and it's going to suck the drama out of your brain. And it's going to drop right there on that page because you're going to go, oh, this is doable. How am I? Because it, it, when it all comes at you at once, it's overwhelming, creates anxiety. When you break it down into bite-sized pieces, one task at a time, one broken thing at a time, you can work through an entire remodel doing that, and you don't have an entire remodel. Or it's exchanging the boogeyman for the repairman. Yeah. That's the switch here. This is the, your first experience being a homeowner where you don't call the landlord and say your stuff's broke. Instead, you've got to take care of it when it breaks. It's one of the reasons we say get out of debt, have an emergency fund before you become a homeowner, because all the stuff would have been an inconvenience at that yeah. point. And, you know, you, you make enough money to get through this, and no, you don't need to sell your house, and really you don't even need to have buyer's remorse. 
I mean, uh, there's a couple of weird things that are here, the inspector missing this stuff, but nothing here says this house is a lemon, that you're the biggest screw up in life because you bought it, you're a horrible person. I didn't hear any of that in this discussion. You got a couple of things broken, fix them. Joys of home ownership. And your payment's reasonable. Fix your dishwasher, enjoy the house. It's that kind of stuff. Just kind of put the drama out of it, put it down on the page, break it down into bite-sized pieces. Look, I love real estate, and I want you to have a house, but I don't want a house to have you. That's why you need to get in touch with Churchill Mortgage to make sure you do this right. These guys are awesome. They'll help you get on a smarter mortgage plan because they're committed to doing what's right for you. That means they check in every year with free consultations to help you stay on the right plan. They show you how to save money and interest so you can build wealth faster. They walk you through the total cost of your loan so you can make the best choice. Basically, they care. That's why we call them Ramsey Trusted. You can achieve debt-free home ownership, and Churchill is here to help. Go to their site, churchillmortgage.com slash Ramsey, to start your approval or get more information. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Well, in the uh, twilight, uh, the in, as 2022 is coming to a close, uh, Congress passed a massive spending bill, of course, because um, that's what you should do if you're in Congress. And uh, but a good the good news is, as a part of that, they also passed what is appropriately called the Secure. Act of 2022, 2.0. So what is the SECURE Act 2.0? Well, it changes a bunch of things in your retirement and a couple of things in your student loans as well. And a good blog at RamseySolutions.com right now, very good detail on this, unpacked. Uh, if you want to get in there and really look at it and, and plug around. I think we post those blogs on Facebook too, if I remember, James. And uh, But George, I want to take a minute since that blog's out there and you guys can go through it all and, and look at it in detail. But for those of you that don't make it over the blog, let's hit the highlights. Yeah, there's a ton in here that really help a lot of people with their retirement. I mean, it's Secure Act stands for setting every community up for retirement enhancement. So kudos to the marketing team that got to create that little acronym there. Yeah, well, good luck with that part. But anyway, it's good. It's good updates. It's some things that needed to happen. Yeah. So it's starting with required minimum distributions. You'll hear these called RMDs. The age is rising to 73 instead of 72, which means you have an extra year without the government tapping you to get some of their cash. Yeah. It, required minimum distributions are your 401k, your Roth, or your, not Roth, your traditional IRAs. They require you to start taking money out at a minimum schedule so they can tax it. And it used to be 70 and a half, then it moved to 72, and with this it moves to 73. So you can leave your money alone and not touch it till 73 now. That's good. Next one, no more required minimum distributions from Roth 401ks and Roth 403bs. So this one's interesting because you've already paid the taxes on it. So they're saying you've already paid the taxes, you can just have it. It doesn't do anything to force you to tar start taking it out on RMDs. So we're going to let you just let it sit there and grow tax-free. You don't we ever love have that. to take it. Another reason to love a Roth. That's great. Next up, smaller penalties for missed required minimum distributions. It was 50%. It's coming down to 25%. Yeah, if you miss your RMDs. Yeah, simple. That's good. Uh, next, higher catch-up contributions on the way. So if you're 50 years or older, there's a lot of great uh, ways you can step up your retirement, you know, put an extra 1000 in your IRA, for example, an extra 5000 extra 7500 in your 401ks, and they're increasing that. Yeah, 60 to 63, beginning in 25, in 2025, January 1, if you're age 6 to six, 60 to 63, you'll be able to put $10,000 annually into a workplace retirement plan, an additional $10,000. 
And so it allows you, if you're, quote, running behind, is it too late for me? This is for you, right? Love it. All right. Next up on the good news front, easier access to retirement funds for emergencies, Not or is news. it? Not good news. That's one of the downers of this plan here. We were doing so great, Dave. We, yeah. we were on a great we were roll. We a thousand until we got to stupid land here. And so here's what this means. Uh, starting in 2024, you can withdraw up to $1,000 from your retirement account for personal or family emergencies. If you've been listening to the show for more than uh, 10 seconds, you'll know that you should never tap your retirement accounts for emergencies. Yeah, you should have an emergency fund and leave your free retirement account alone oh. and let it grow and make you rich. Absolutely. All right. Dum, 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 dum. Here's an interesting one. Curious to get your take on this, Dave. Employers must automatically enroll you into a workplace retirement plan. This is nanny state stuff. Holding your a, hand. This is a, we're going to take care of you because you're too stupid to take care of yourself idea. And so now when you join a company that has a 401k, the company is required to sign you up for the 401k automatically. At an automatic minimum contribution rate of 3%. And if you don't want that to happen, you have to opt out. Manually go in and opt out. You have to stop it from occurring. Uh, See, so that's too much control. It's got a good intent. Want everybody to have a retirement account. That's a good thing. Yes, you need to be in your 401k, but let's say you're working the baby steps, you would need to opt out because Pause. you're not doing 401k because you're on baby step two. Well, and the other problem is if you are in a place to invest, you've got 3%, you don't realize it. You need to up that to 15% if you're out of debt with a fully funded emergency fund. Yeah. So it, be sure you pay attention to that yeah, stuff. Don't, don't, you know, we're from the government, and we're here to help. These are scary words, okay? A 3% rate is not going to get you very far in retirement, so we've got to do better for sure. Uh, next, this has been one of uh, some hot debate. Employers can match your student loan payments with retirement contributions. It's so, confusing. Yes. So it sounds like they're paying your student loans. Now, some employers are now offering a benefit that has nothing to do with this, just where they will help you pay your student loans off. One way or another, whatever it is, they'll give you, they'll match you, they'll do whatever. It has nothing to do with anything uh, as far as this stuff goes. This is not that. This is you pay up to $3,000 on your student loan and your employer puts up to $3,000 into your 401k, which doesn't, it's just uh, like. Wouldn't that incentivize you to never pay off your student loans? Like we want you to eat apples, so we're going to chop oranges. It's just weird. It's it, you, you mix these things up, and, and people are, are getting confused about it already. They think it means the government's going to pay part of your student, or the employer's going to pay part of your student loan and match you on what you're putting on your student loan. They're not. They have to put it in the 401k. So it's weird. Well, it's, it's because it's student Anything loans. that gets more money against your student loan or causes you to do that, anything that gets more money into your retirement, I'm for all of that, but this is just convoluted and weird. Well, wouldn't you be pissed if you already paid off your student loans or didn't have any, and Joe Schmo's next to you is getting an extra three grand in his 401k? It's a benefit, though. That's your employer offering a benefit. The employer's not required to offer this benefit. I'm curious to see how many employers do this. Yeah, I, I don't think they'll... Well, you never know. You never, never know. know out there. All right. Next up, you can roll over unused 529 plan funds to a Roth IRA. Ding, ding. This one's good. This one I love. Because that's been a big you know, point of objection. People go, well, Dave, what if my kid doesn't go to college? They don't use all the money. That money's just wasted. Yeah, it's not. You, now after you can roll 50, it After over. 15 years, your kid rolls it into their Roth IRA, no penalties. Up to the annual contribution. So you put 100, 000, $150,000 bucks into a uh, 529. Uh, kid uses seventy five or 80000 of it, whatever's left in there, sits there 15 years growing tax-free in good mutual funds, and then they roll it into a Roth IRA into good mutual funds, and it continues to grow tax-free. No penalties. That one I'm a huge fan of. I love this one. This is a fun one, too. Roth options are now available for simple IRAs and SEP IRAs. So folks that are self-employed, business owners, this is cool. I'm confused. I thought that was already there. I'm not sure. They the didn't. Roth I'm not SEP sure and they Roth didn't. Simple. Yeah, I'm not sure they didn't already have that, but I could be wrong. So it's good, though. Yeah, the simple IRA is simply a 401k for small business, uh, and the SEP IRA is a... Uh, the simple, the simple incentive match plan for it's it's best used by a uh, a solopreneur because if you have employees you have to put the same amount in you got to put it. in for yourself so we seldom use SEP IRAs much but simple IRAs are great for small businesses to open up and now they can do a Roth that's good news and lastly new emergency savings account option alongside retirement accounts mm -mm. so this one's a little different than the previous one. 
Um, but it's saying that the employer can set aside up to 2500 annually for non-highly compensated employees in a separate emergency savings alongside their retirement account. Yeah. So it's a little sidecar here. Yeah. But and is it invested? The problem is, is 2500 is not enough for an emergency fund. And so then you've got the 1000 you can take out of your 401k for your emergency, and you've got it all over at the employer. And so people get the idea, oh, my emergency fund's taken care of. It's not. There's not enough money. There's very few of you that three to six months of expenses represents 2500 bucks. Mm. So this is a... This is one of those head fakes that the government's saying, hey, look, we did something, and you didn't want really to do anything because it's not, it's not sufficient to cover it. Now, if they could do up to $10,000 in there or something, that might cover some people's you know, re- emergency not fund. Not enough to, to do any damage yeah, I, here. I so. wouldn't use this instead of your emergency fund, and I wouldn't use the option to cash money out of your 401k for emergencies either as your emergency fund. I wouldn't do either one. I'd leave all of that alone. Well, credit where credit's due. There's a lot of wins in here, and you guys can check out the entire article. We've got it linked in the show notes, wherever you're listening, of course, at RamseySolutions.com. But I needed a win today. I'm going to yeah. call this a win. I'm going to call it a win. We pick on, and we, we can even allow uh, President Joe Biden to call a win. He signed it. I'm sure he's already tweeted it. He signed it. And so he gets a win on that. Way to go, President Biden. You don't hear that often from Dave. Not not at often at all. Can't shoot down a balloon, but you can sign this. This is The Ramsey Show. Joining us, America. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co host today. Nick is with us. Nick is in Louisville, Kentucky. Hi, Nick. How are you? Oh, I'm hanging in there like a hair in a biscuit. Love it. How can we help, brother? Um, I recently started uh, following y'all on YouTube and I'm trying to figure this all out. I don't know if you go over it in your uh, school and, or college, whatever it's called, university. But I have a question about tithing. I've been able to do it pretty well. And on my tax return, I know you say that it's just a refund, but am I supposed to tithe on it? Oh, your tax refund, would you tithe on it? Yeah. Uh, if you've tithed on your total income, no, because that's just your money coming back to you. Let, let's say that you tithed on your total income and you took $5,000 and put it in a savings account. When you took the $5,000 out of the savings account, you wouldn't pay tithe on it. Because it had already right. been tithed on before you put it in there. A tax refund is exactly the same thing. If you're tithing on your gross uh, income, are you? Before you're tithing I mean, before tithe tax or after tax? After tax. After tax? Yeah. Let's see. So, well, I mean, uh, let me think how the math would work then. So the refund. Now I tithe on what comes in. What you actually get in your hand. Is what you're tithing. Yes, what I get in my hand, whether it be yeah. a bonus or anything. And you paid too much in, which would have, if you had brought that home, you would have brought more home. In that case, you would tithe on the refund. Because if it was set okay. up properly and no refund, that money would have come home and you would have tithed on it. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you're tithing, yeah, on, you're like tithing on take-home pay, right? And your your take right. home pay is too low, that's why you got a refund. Because you had too much taken out of your taxes. So if you correct this and had a zero refund, you would be bringing home more the equivalent of that refund. Does that make sense? Right. Right. And so it's a math riddle is all it is, but so let me let me just use that as an opportunity then to, to you know, to go back to what we cover in, in Financial Peace University on tithing, obviously tithing is something, it's a biblical uh, guideline for giving a tenth of your income. Uh, typically, it's uh, observed by evangelical Christians like me and George 
and you, Nick, I assume, and by uh, uh, Orthodox Jews. Jew Jewish uh, tradition also respects and endorses the tithe as well, because it's an Old Testament item. It's a, their Bible, our Old Testament, so where it comes from. So having said all of that, uh, just let everybody know this is not like a— uh, uh, and I don't, I don't sense this off of you, Nick. I'm just using the fact that you asked the question as an opportunity to talk about it a little bit. But uh, uh, it, you never tithe uh, from a legalism standpoint, or this makes God love me more, or he owes me something back because I tithe at the standpoint. This is simply me being obedient to my faith, and this is a baseline of giving to do a rhythm of giving. And a lot of people tithe. Uh, I tithe on my gross before taxes, not after tax. And, that, and the point, though, is it doesn't matter because uh, God's not mad at you or mad or, or more pleased with me because I gave more. That's not how this works. This is he, our Heavenly Father who loves us, is trying to teach us to be generous. And so a part of our rhythm is we make money, we give some of it. We make money, we give some of it. We make money, we give some of it. And that's why the tithe is tied into our spiritual walk. Uh, if you're not a Christian and you're out there, you're not Jewish and you're out there, you still need to observe something like this to create, to build your generosity muscle on a rhythm basis, not on an occasional random basis. So mm. really, really good question, Nick. Yeah, it's nuanced, and the heart is the real issue, and Nick's got that part taken care of. Yeah, The got... motive is great. He's just wondering, the nuances of this I'm confused by, and you've always said in FPU, gross, net, we can have discussions all day and pull I apart Bible the, I verses. I tie on the gross, and that way when I get to heaven, if I'm wrong, I'm on the upside, right? So <laughs> It's a joke. It's not a it's bad a plan. It's a joke, okay? So here's, yeah. But it's always first in the budget for a good reason. And it's God, a reminder. God does not it. need your money. He's God. He, if he wants something to happen, he'll do it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about it. This is about him teaching you how to be generous, him teaching you how to build your generosity muscle by working it out. Every time there's a paycheck, I lift. Every time there's a paycheck, I lift that generosity up. I lift it. I do it. And, and it becomes a part of your life. Interesting study I read years ago, George, on this. It's worth sidebarring on because generosity is really the reason to build wealth. Change your family tree, take care of your, your family, your kids, your grandbabies, that kind of stuff. A godly man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Um, and, and so inheritance is a biblical process. And, and also to be unbelievably outrageously generous and, and to push all that through. But one of the studies I found was they, they interviewed people uh, asking them, uh, tell me about generosity. Tell me about a time that generosity is in your life. And when they interviewed old people of faith, they talked about a lifetime of this rhythm of giving steadily over time. When they interviewed middle people, middle-aged people, they talked about the one time that they gave something. When they interviewed extremely young people like teens and even children, when they asked them about generosity, they described a time they received something. And the point being that as you emotionally mature, hopefully spiritually mature, you're going to start to realize what Nick is doing is, whether you're a person of faith or not, it is a, uh, it's a part of your emotional maturity journey because the more mature people are the ones that described a steady diet, a steady life of outgoing generosity. The children... Receive, described receiving something. Mm. And so adults devise a plan and follow it. Children do what feels good, even applies to generosity. Man, that's incredible. Well, and it's such a great piece when we talk about there's only three things you can do with money. It's a tool. You can give it, save it, and spend it. And you've said that giving is the most fun you can have with money. It is. It just makes you more of a, who you are. And so if you're a generous person when you're broke, you're going to be real generous when you've got some money. Yeah. It increases your creativity. Increases the quality of your relationships. There's all kinds of data that your quality of life goes up and your probability of wealth building goes up as you increase your generosity. And you live longer. Science is showing. Yeah. It, it's it's lowers your blood pressure to be generous. Exactly. It's it amazing. Really does because you're other centered instead of self centered. Also, for that reason, generous people are more attractive. Uh, people, you want to be around them not because they're giving you money, but just because they're they're the person that hold the door. 
They're the person to help you pick up your groceries when they spill out of one of those stupid bags and roll all over the parking lot, right? Well, I found they're less stressed. Yeah, that's it. That's amazing. Love it, love it, love it. So that's the thing. So, Nick, really good question. Thanks for letting us have that uh, as an excuse to get up on our yes. generosity soapbox. Because I got to tell you, very few times do selfish people make you cry. But generous people will make your eyes leak. When you start watching someone do something generous, it, it gets up in your throat and you feel it. Your throat gets tight and you're like, oh, man, that's just. That's just, and, and you're not even necessarily focusing on that person going, oh, that person is so cool. You're saying what they're doing is so mm. cool. And there's three types. There's planned generosity, which is great. There's spontaneous generosity, which can make us cry. But then there's outrageous generosity, which is where the tears are just streaming down our face as we see the video on social media. And there's such a beauty and joy to it. And we could all use a little bit more of that this year. Yeah. Mind-blowing. Mm -hmm. generosity that last one i like it just blow somebody's mind and you know ha have this opportunity to do something that is it's just unbelievable it's just like, wow and th those are get yourself in a position to have those moments a and man when you're broke and all you're doing is paying payments to stupid mastercard and ford motor credit uh, you're not thinking about other people all you're thinking about yourself mm. and it's because you're trying to freaking survive it's not because you're a bad person but the more you get in control, the more you put together a plan, the more you can be other-centered. And it works. That's good. And everyone needs to go watch Lesson 9 of Financial Peace University, where you talk about this. It is, man, gets me every time. It's a good lesson. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. The phone number is 888-825-5225. Brenda starts off this hour in San Diego. Hi, Brenda. How are you? Hi, I'm wonderful. I feel blessed to be able to talk to you today. Well, you too. How can we help? Um, well, my husband and I are trying to do kind of a retirement sprint. Um, and so we moved to San Diego to increase our income. Um, we have a home where we, uh, in the Midwest, that's fully paid for. And so we will be out here three to five more years. And we're wondering about the wisdom of buying a condo or something instead of paying rent. Um, I know there's different rules for a second home, um, but I, I'm just not sure in that short time period with all the closing costs and everything. Um, I wanted to know what you'd advise. This is your residence for now because you're living there. Exactly. Okay. For, for another three to five years. We've been renting for about a year. When we moved out here, my husband was a contractor and got a very generous housing allowance. Mm -hmm. um, but now as an employee, and I'm also an employee, mm -hmm. um, we have about $14,000 a month after expenses, mm -hmm. um, or about income, and then after expenses, um, including fully maxing our our four hundred ones at work and everything. We have about an extra eight thousand a month, so we could really, really pack on the house payments. But then, in about five years, we would want to sell. We wouldn't want to have a rental that far away. Exactly. And I don't think it makes sense to have a second home that far away. Agree. So, so you're going to buy it and you're going to sell it when you leave. That, if yeah. that makes sense. That's the, the only thing that would make, that's procedure. the only thing that, that's the only way it makes sense. You're not going to buy it and keep it. Okay. So mm -hmm. that tells us what our math formula is then. Is okay. the house going to go up or the condo going to go up in value during three years enough 
to pay the expenses when you sell it and still make a profit. And I've looked at the trends, and sometimes it definitely has, and sometimes it stays flat <laughs> yeah. for a few years. Yeah. And the, because the, we're looking at six to seven hundred thousand dollar townhouse, which is a modest um, yes. in the area we are, definitely. And um, you know, you're looking at quite a bit of closing costs mm-hmm. and property tax and insurance and everything. And right now, our rent is thirty six hundred dollars a month, mm-hmm. um, which is in a nice, safe area, and we are paying a little more than we should. But you know, we've we've got money in the bank. Homes are paid off, so that was one of the things we're doing for ourselves. Um, so, but we would be looking at you know around four to five thousand dollars a month at least on a fifteen-year loan, and I I just am not sure that it pencils out. And so I, yeah. since you guys are such wonderful math whizzes, I thought <laughs> I would pick your brain. So, how much money do you guys have in cash, non-retirement? Uh, right now, about two hundred and forty. Okay, and that includes your emergency fund. So you'd put the majority of that as a down payment. Um, yeah. Well, I have. Um, I just put eighty the other day in a four percent CD, um, kind of as our emergency fund because we had so much, and that's part of the reason I'm calling now is we're, we're getting an uncomfortably large amount of money, not which we never had before in our lives, um, not doing a whole lot for us. Right. Um, so we would need to invest this somehow, and of course the market's down, quote unquote, and things are on sale. Um, so we could definitely do that. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've never had this situation before. Yeah. Good you know, for you. We, well, we started to go. out great for ten years, and yeah. then kind of fell off the wagon for ten years, and now we're trying to sprint into retirement. Um, but we are baby step millionaires, and so. Yeah. I feel like we have choices, which is such a great place to be. I don't think you're going to get rich buying this condo, (laughs) and I don't think you're going to uh, save enough if you don't buy it to get rich. So it's more of do I want to be an owner out there in California during this time? Because, I mean, San Diego is a great market. It's going to do well. Uh, real estate we're predicting nationally is going to go up three to seven percent a year for the next three or four years. San Diego will probably do more than that, which will be enough for you to break even or make a profit, but you're not going to make a ton of money to where it's like, Oh, I'm so happy. I did this. It changed my life. That's not going to happen. And you're not going to lose enough either that that it's going to change your goals here. Uh, which kind of makes me think I might just rent just because of the hassle. And that's kind of where I'm at, because even if we just make a little bit, when you're looking at 6% closing closing costs and taxes, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we've already taken our, um, what Mm -hmm. is that one time when you sell a house and and you get a certain allowance? No, you get that. You get that every two years. Oh, you do. Okay. Well, yeah. we could take that. If it's your personal, versus, if it's your personal residence, you can make up to a half million dollars filing jointly if you've owned the house two years. Even if it's not your only residence, it is your permanent residence. This is where you live. But, but it's 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 not because well, yes, it yeah, is our permanent resident that we'll no. move back to to retire in is still back there. Paid no, off. you you live there in another state. Right. You live there full time. Yeah. You live there. This is your residence. You, esta- okay. you establish okay. residence, so there's no question about that. You, that'll pass the smell test on the taxes. All of that said, okay. though, you're probably going to take on a bigger payment and the hassle of home ownership and the hassle of having to divest the condo, get rid of it when you move again, and all of this for 50 or 60 grand or something. And I'm just not going to fool with it. If I were you, I'd just stay there and rent and just enjoy this. Life is simple when you're a renter. Yes, it, it, I, I'm enjoying that part. And yeah. I, I think that Five years of a couple hundred thousand dollars in investments would be more than that fifty grand. Yeah, yeah, I think you're going to do just Even fine. If the market goes down. I think it will go up higher than that. Yeah, I, and if I you just, buy, if you if you enjoy real estate and you want to buy some real estate back home after you get back there, you're going to have some money to do that with. So, you know, after you after you ha- finish this San Diego adventure, you're yeah. on. So, but for now, I mean, I would I'd park that money. I don't love the idea of the CD as your emergency fund because it's locked up in the CD, and if you take that money out early, there's going to be some penalties. But you could invest the money, like Dave said, into the market and take two hundred of that, and you could make some money off of that. You could park it in a high yield savings account and make you know four percent right now. Um, but I wouldn't just let it sit in the account either. 
So yep. do something. Make a move either Absolutely. way. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, hey, good question. Good discussion. Thank you for calling in. Open phones here at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. You jump in. We'll talk to you about your life and your money. It's a free call. Hey, Financial Peace University is up and running. If you want to get into a class, now is the time to do it. If you've uh, your resolution uh, needs to be resolutioned, well, we can help you with that. We'll get you out of debt, help you build some wealth. Go to RamseySolutions.com slash FPU class and get into a Financial Peace University class right now. This is the class that's helped 10 million people really do this. RamseySolutions.com slash FPU class. We've been doing business at Ramsey for more than 30 years. By now, we're a well-oiled machine, but it wasn't always that way. Yes, we've always had a vision, always had determination, and a drive to help people, but what we didn't have was one central place to access all our numbers so that we could get further ahead or quickly see when we needed to pivot. We were always jumping back and forth between different systems and spreadsheets. So when NetSuite by Oracle helped us wrangle our revenue, inventory, expenses, and more into one place, it was a game changer. And NetSuite's number one cloud financial system can help your business gain the same visibility because businesses thrive on timely data. And NetSuite's real-time analytics can help your business have immediate access to your numbers daily so you always know where you stand and you can move quickly. So go to netsuite.com slash Ramsey today and set up a free product tour. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Let's face it, taxes are confusing. And if you buy what some of the tax services out there say, you think you never get a grasp on taxes. You have to have somebody do it for you because you're too stupid. Well, we don't think that. Today's tax tip, we think you can do it. We think you're smarter than that, and you deserve the truth. Most tax software exists for one reason, to take your money. They fee you to death with upcharges, processing fees, and they want to sell you into buying debt. They're trying to, they use the tax software to gather your name and sell to you then. Uh, but now you can say no more. Take control of your taxes. Use a service that's on your side, like Ramsey Smart Tax. It guides you through the process of filing online with low upfront pricing, no hidden fees, no sneaky offers to put you into debt. Ramsey Smart Tax gives you two easy ways to file. They both include all major federal forms and deductions from the start, which can save you up to 70% versus using other software. So you just decide the level of support you want for your questions, and you can add a state return if you need to. RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. It's easy, and you're smart enough to do it. RamseySolutions.com slash smart tax. Vic's in St. Louis. Hi, Vic. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, good afternoon. I hope your Wednesday's going well. It is, brother. How can we help? So I am a government employee working for the Air Force nearby. I'm invested in the thrift savings plan, and I'm also familiar with, with your mutual fund investing strategy and across equally across the four types of funds. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm looking to retire in about four years and I'll direct transfer, you know, equally into those funds. But my question pertains to when it comes to taking the distributions, how do I do that? Do I equal withdrawals or is there a situation where maybe I don't want to take as much out of, say, the growth in income or the international? I was just wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. I didn't really see anything on your, your website about that. 
the truth is it doesn't matter much. Um, what you need to do is just figure out what you, how much money you need coming home and just have that amount come out of whichever funds you want to pick. You can have it done equally I'm, across I'm them. I'm retired Air Force, yeah. so it's probably not going to be a lot. It'll just be whatever the required minimum distribution happens to be. Yeah, and you won't have that till 73. Right. So even then, when you get there, what, how much would you take, or what are you going to take? You're going to take you set, set your required minimums or set an amount or percentage, whichever one you want to do, and you can have it come across all of them equally, or you can have it come from one until it's gone and leave all the others in place. Like if you have a fund that's really cooking and you like it, uh, maybe you leave it alone and you drain off some of the others. Right. You know, that's okay. Uh, you can sit down with your Smart Vester Pro at that time, and they'll help you develop a strategy. But there's not a right or wrong thing here. Uh, it's not like, oh, well, you absolutely need to go ahead and, you know, drain that dog fund off and, you know, let that one that's cooking real good, let it keep going. That's not a bad plan. It's not the end of the world. But you've already made it by then. So you're in good shape. You're making money. You've, you know, you've built some wealth. Now it's just a matter of maximizing it and uh, and, and so forth. So you're right. You're you're probably not actually going to be taking anything until you're forced to. That's a good uh, problem to have. Yeah, that's a great problem to have. And thank you for your service, Vic. Absolutely. Tyler is with us. Tyler is in Chicago. Hey, Tyler, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So uh, me and my wife are having some disagreements on how we want to go about paying off uh, our debts. You know, I'm I'm a heavy Dave Ramsey listener. I listen to you guys all the time, and I follow the baby steps. Whereas she's um, she's been raised her whole life to believe, you know, just pay the minimum payment until it's all paid off that way. So I'm wondering a way forward on how we can agree on how to attack our debt. This is a fun one. So how much debt do you guys have? So currently I have a truck loan with about 1300 left on it. And we have both have student loans at about eight thousand apiece, and that's everything. That's everything. Okay. What's, what's your, your income? What's your household income? Uh, so I'm active duty Navy, so I make around I made uh, around forty six thousand last year. And is she working outside the home? Uh, no, she's a stay at home mom. We we have a four month old daughter. Okay. So we're looking at seventeen thousand dollars in debt. With a $46,000 income. Correct. This feels like a solvable problem, uh, but it sounds like she doesn't want to get out of debt. If you're just making the minimum payments, you're talking about, you know, a 10, 20 year payoff plan with the the interest causing the loan to balloon. Exactly. I mean, I've, I've laid every bit of evidence and piece of information out showing, I mean, I made a debt payoff tracker. I made a very detailed budget for us to go off of. and But this isn't a disagreement that, on we, how to get out of debt. It's a disagreement on should we get out of debt. Exactly. So she, does she feel, I, are you feeling the pressure? Or is she feeling the pressure of this debt in your life? Are you guys living your I best mean, life? I, I mean, yeah, we we save a lot of money. I mean, we, we have about 30000 in our savings account right now. So you could pay it off we're today. Not, we're not hurting at all, but she's she's more concerned about investing now because she's she's uh she's really big on investing she's been doing it for a long time she's more worried about getting money and investments now and paying off debts later rather than vice versa like how i believe how how old are you guys Uh, i am 26 and she's 24 okay um so here's the thing. Uh, she's broke and 24 years old. So her, her plan's not working. And she's not big on investing. She's not old enough to have been big on investing very long. A maximum of a few years. And mm-hmm. so you got $30,000 in savings. It's not about Dave Ramsey, and it's not just about getting out of debt, and it's not about the Ramsey way or something like that. The question on the table should be, that the two of you need to consider, is what is the shortest right way to build wealth, and what is the data to back that up? Okay? 
There is zero research that indicates her process is going to work. There's zero evidence that rich people do it the way she's talking about. None. None. Mm -hmm. So it's not got anything to do with me or you or is my way right, your way's right. It's a matter of the data when you when you study millionaires, you don't find any of them became millionaires doing what she's talking about doing. Instead, they almost unanimously agree. And, and you know, 79%, 84%, 92% agree that the way we got wealthy is we got out of debt, so we had more money to invest. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's, that's the point that I've been trying to make for the longest time. Yeah. And, and so, you know, her theory is just that it's a theory and there's no data to back up that she's right. So I'm not sure where all this arrogance is coming from at 24 years old. I mean, how much are you guys investing right now? Um, so I currently do, so I have TSP through the military. I, I do 10% with the 5% match and she recently rolled over her uh, her retirement from her last job into a Roth IRA, and we're investing in that, and that has about $2,000 in it. And well, show her on paper. Here's what it's going to cost us in interest to pay off this debt over the next 20 years, and here's how much we could make in the market if we paid off the debt today, invested that payment, and still had thirteen grand left over in savings. Yeah. She wants to argue with math. That's the way to do it. But I think it's beyond math. Tyler, at the point that someone, that the two of you on any issue as a married couple cannot find uh, some common ground off of actual data that indicates the behavior you're engaging in, raising kids or being married or building wealth or having a career, if you can't come into agreement on that, at some point you got to sit down with a marriage counselor. If you can't get past that, what you should do today is write a check and pay off everything. On baby step number one, huh? How'd you guess? With health care costs rising, learn how Christian Healthcare Ministries can help you make the most out of your budget. Visit chministries.org slash budget. Don't worry, it's worth it. George Campbell Ramsey personality is my co-host today. Chuck and Cindy are on the line for a very special debt-free scream. Uh, Cindy, are you with us? Yep. Chuck and I are both right here. Hey, Chuck. I know you're not speaking to me right now, but I just want to tell you hello. So uh, Cindy reached out to our uh, Ramsey concierge team, and so did Chuck's hospice nurse, uh, asking to, as a hospice wish, to uh, to do their debt-free scream, and that's how we got introduced to Chuck and Cindy uh, over the last uh, w- couple of weeks here around Ramsey, and then got it set up with Austin, our associate producer, to do your all's debt-free scream today. So, uh, Cindy, let's start off with how much debt you've paid. So we've paid off one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, and it was mostly just mortgage stuff. Um, mm-hmm. We had paid off some other stuff after Chuck, uh, while Chuck was in Afghanistan, um, but we had paid off when we started the Ramsey plan. We paid off our mortgage. So. Yeah, you paid off your mortgage, one hundred twenty thousand dollars. How long did that take? About seventy five months. Excellent, excellent. And Chuck was in Afghanistan with the military. He was. He oh. was um, what they call a dirt sailor. He was a Navy guy in the. Um, Afghanistan arena as a basically a middle manager because yeah. they didn't have enough apparently so 
Well, thank you. Thank you for your service, Chuck. We love you. We appreciate you. All right. Now, tell us your story of how we get to this call today and what's been going on with you and Chuck. Uh, I'll try and do it without crying. Um, So in June, um, Chuck was diagnosed with um, terminal brain cancer called a glioblastoma. And um, prior to that, we had, you know, we had been debt-free and um, we're living our lives and we're so happy enjoying our lives and um, when he got sick one of the things that I um, that I was so grateful for was that we were definitely um, on the Ramsey plan because I didn't have a mortgage that I had to stress about paying off or paying at all like no mortgage payment we had no consumer debt and um, we had our um, we had six months worth of expenses set aside. And when he first got sick, um, I sold my car and um, our little pop-up camper in order to move that to ten months worth of expenses of our normal expenses. Mm-hmm. So um, so that has that what a relief. Yeah. I mean, so you, let me I get my timeline right. So you were debt free, mortgage, and everything before June of last year. Yes. Okay, so you're a little we you're a little late to do your debt free scream here, but of course we got <laughs> you on the phone anyway, right? But so yeah. so you're a hundred percent debt free, house and everything. And how old are you? Um, we are fifty five and fifty six. Okay, and that all happened, and then he gets this diagnosis. Yep. In June. Yep. Okay. Yep. And uh, and so since June, we've been fighting terminal brain cancer. Yep. Wow. Yep. One day at a time and filled with gratitude. Amen. Mm. Amen. Uh, but he, he uh, expressed to his hospice nurse that he didn't ever do his debt-free scream when he paid off the mortgage, and that was one of the things he wanted to do. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> he's nodding his head. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was this process like for you guys as you attacked the mortgage? So, um, we were probably a little different than most other people because we we did all of ours with, um, I'll say, budgeting. You know, we were just really way more attentive to the budget. Um, we had taught. Financial Peace University six times, and each time we were able to kind of look at our budget a little bit differently um, with a slightly different perspective. And um, so we, you know, we we used our income to pay down the mortgage. And, you know, it was basically an extra thousand dollars a month or if there was, you know, something else left in the budget at the end of the month, we're like, okay, well, well, let's throw that to the mortgage, too. Um, you know, because every dollar's got to have its name. So, you know, we just kept throwing ex- any extra money that we had in the budget towards the mortgage. Mm. Okay. Um, people often say, I don't want to work this get out of debt plan. I need to live my life because life's short. And uh, mm-hmm. today we're talking about life being short. And yet yep. you all you all sacrificed to be debt free. Do you regret doing that instead of spending all that money doing something else? So, no, because we really lived our life a lot. I mean, we went, I mean, we may have gone camping instead of a four-star hotel, but we went places, we traveled, we lived our lives. We probably spent more time doing some of those things that people say, oh, I can't wait until I retire and I can do whatever. We really focused on living our lives before he got sick. Yeah, and before you got the house paid off even, but then you're still intentional with the budget and dialed it in a little more every time you taught FPU and still got the house paid off. Yeah, I just yeah. want, I just want because sometimes um, it, it's, uh, I have never talked to anyone in 30 years of doing this that regretted the sacrifice of getting out of debt, like they missed something because they did that. You know what I'm saying? No. Oh, I, I agree wholeheartedly. It has been the biggest gift through all of this. Um, I actually, I sent an email a while ago to you guys, and it 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 
went through, you know, all the different filters and said, fill out this form. And I was like, eh, too much work. Um, I was a little lazy. But um, basically, the title of my email was, thank you for saving our bacon. Mm. Because truly, if it hadn't been for the Ramsey program, I am not certain, you know, that I would have been able to literally, I just, I walked out of work on Thursday afternoon, and um, he had his seizure on Friday morning, and I never went back, never looked back, wow. Was knew that we'd be okay. Yeah. Because because of the FPU program. And he, he, he's, uh, okay. he's a good man, and he knows that you're going to be okay. That is one of his biggest concerns was he just wanted to make sure I would be okay. Yeah. And you are. Yep. Yep. Other than a broken heart, which I got yeah. with you, and I'm trying to get through this yeah. without crying, too. <laughs> Sorry. So we're going to be a blubbering mess here together, Chuck. I'm just saying, buddy. Oh, man. <laughs> Whew. So well, mild. <laughs> what, what's your financial situation look like now with him being in hospice and you not working? So um, the VA has stepped up. Um, there's a whole lot of behind the scenes. And if anybody wants that information, I will be very happy. But um, between his work disability, Social Security disability, and the VA disability, as well as the VA paying me to be his caregiver, um, we are, <laughs> we are, we are fine. Yeah. We are absolutely mm. fine. Yeah, good, good. I'm glad to hear that, hon. Well, Chuck, you're a hero, man. You served your absolutely. country. Absolutely. You served your wife, and uh, we are honored to do a dead free scream with you today. Um, pretty stinking incredible. All right, Cindy, you guys ready? Are you ready, Chuck? Yeah. Okay. All right, Chuck and Cindy, Raleigh, North Carolina, $120,000 paid off, house and everything. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, two, one. We're debt free. We're a little quiet. As it should be. Wow. Woo! That's how it's done. Man. Woo. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Wow. Thank you both so much. What a special call. Amen. Honored to be a part of it. Amen. Wow. This is The Ramsey Show. George Campbell, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for joining us, America. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Sometimes one of you will say, Dave, how can we say thank you? Well, I'll tell you how. If you want to say thank you for the show and for the information and the inspiration that comes from these microphones, there's an easy way to do that. Subscribe to the show. Hit follow or subscribe on your YouTube button, your Spotify, your Apple button, whatever it is. Share the show. Share the link to the podcast. Share the radio station you listen to us on. Tell your friends about it. Uh, and, you know, leave a review, a five-star review. Mama said if you ain't got nothing nice to say, don't say nothing at all. So there you go. So leave a review, subscribe, follow, whatever that process is, and share it, whatever medium or media you listen to. Let people know this is happening. You're the secret sauce as to why this has been successful. The Ramsey Show is 30 years old, and we have never done any marketing to amount to anything. Never done any national advertising on the Super Bowl ads or anything else to tell people we're here. The 
25 million of you that listen every week through the various ways that we broadcast this are all here because somebody told you about it. Thank you for that. We appreciate you very, very much. Samantha is with us in Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, Samantha. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. How can we help? So me and my husband got married a couple months ago, and we are working the baby steps. We are on baby step four, where we're trying to invest and make sure our retirement's all set up and going good. Um, But we're running into a little bit of a debate, I guess, between the two of us of trying to manage investing the amount we need to for retirement, but also saving cash for a house in the next couple of years is our real goal um, to have a good house down payment and get into a home. So we're trying to prioritize saving for a house down payment versus, you know, following the investing advice we need to as far as retirement. So that's what I wanted to talk to you about. Cool. So what's your down payment goal? So when we did the calculations with a couple of different calculators and you guys, we feel like we have got, especially within this market, it needs to be below 300K um, as far as like the total for the house. So we're trying to save up, I mean, 5% of that would obviously be the minimum, but we want to do more if we can. Okay. So 15,000 minimum. And if you continue yeah. investing your 15%, how long would it take you to get $15,000 on top of that? That's what we're trying to figure out. We actually just started financial peace, so we're trying to get together a budget. Um, but I guess built into this question is, like, for my company, I have a 401k that I'm already investing 15% into. But for him, he just got a new job where he doesn't have a 401k offered, and so he was offered a stock option. And we didn't know if he should be investing into that or what we should do to make sure we're still investing what we need to well, he'll also have the option for an IRA, which will be outside of his employer, that you guys can max out to get to that 15%. And it's just 15% of household income. And so if it needs to be weighted towards your 401k plus your two IRAs, you can do it that way. But the discussion here is really about how soon are you re- you're really wanting to be homeowners. And if you want to take down your investing a little bit to do that, to speed up the down payment process, you can do that. I would rather find other ways to do it, like increase income to get there personally. But there's no right or wrong okay. here, as long as you're not pausing investing for a period of longer than two years. Okay, so if I'm having my 15% and my company 401k... If you and stop all retirement up. temporarily for two years and pile up mm-hmm. money for your down payment, that's what we call baby step 3B, and that fits within our plan. It's a temporary thing, because you're going to, you got plenty of time. How old are you guys? 26 and 27. Okay. And so, you know, you're you're 28 and 29, and you start investing 15% of your household income into retirement, and you have a fully funded emergency fund and no debt except the house, and now you're a homeowner. This is two years from now. You're going to be very, very wealthy. You'll be just fine. Or you can say, you know, we're going to continue to put uh, less than 15% of household income in, but we're going to put something in to retirement. And that's going to slow down or limit the amount of our down payment in our three, what we call 3B. In other words, after baby step three of the emergency fund, then we start saving for a house. And then, and, and what people do during that time is they put zero to 15% of their household income into retirement. Anywhere between zero and 15% for that two year period of time is fine. And then, then you get the house bought, and you put a solid 15% in there. You start working kids' college if you've got kids on the way by then. And, um, and you start working to pay off that mortgage then is baby step six, as you have already discovered. So the truth is you're not really ready to answer this question because you haven't even done your budget yet. And you haven't looked at how long it's going to take. All you did is you pick out a house range of 300,000 and you've still got, you know, you got retirement accounts kind of lingering back from before you were married and he just got a new job and we just started FPU and we're trying to learn all this. So just sit, it's okay. Just breathe. Just sit right there, do your budget together and then decide, okay, we're going to put nothing into retirement for a short period of time, build up our, build up our down payment really fast, or we're going to put 10% or 8% and they're going to build it up a little slower, or we're going to put the full 15% in, and like George said, we're going to take a side hustle of some kind or something and get the income up to build the down payment that way. 
any of that is okay. Any of that's okay. You just don't want to have nothing going into retirement for 20 years. You don't want to have uh, everything going into retirement, 25% going into retirement, or 30% of your income going into retirement, and never save up a down payment for a house. So you've, you've just gotten married. Now we're getting a house. Now we're getting a new job. you got a lot going on. You're going to get there. Just just breathe a little bit. By this time next year, you're going to be really in stride. You're going to have a rhythm to this, and you're going to be able to lay these goals out very clearly from Financial Peace University. You're doing really, really good. Really good start there. Tyler's in Fresno. Hey, Tyler, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, how's it going? Better than we deserve. How how can we help? Hey, uh, so so I just got involved with uh, with the whole Ramsey experience, and, and I guess, uh, my biggest question to you is, so I'm right now I'm seventy thousand dollars in debt. Um, Twenty nine thousand of that is through a four hundred one k loan that that I've taken out on myself, and I'm wondering since I'm paying that back to myself, do is that still part of the snowball or or how should I how should I classify that? Yes, all consumer debt, which we would classify that 401k loan as consumer debt, would fall into the debt snowball. The only thing that wouldn't is your mortgage and sometimes a HELOC if it's a huge, huge, huge number. So what other debt do you have and how much is it? Uh, Sorry, we lost you on the line there. No, Okay, try again. All right. Nope. How much debt is it? You got me. So uh, total I have $70,000 in debt and uh, that comes from... 29 of it, like I said, being the 401k loan. And then the other debt, I have $11,000 for my truck loan. Uh, I have a dirt bike, which is $13,000. And I have my wife's uh, forerunner, which is also $16,000. What's your household income? Uh, so total, I, I'm my my annual is uh, 142 uh, 500, um, and that's without overtime. I mostly make overtime, and my wife um, do around 10 grand. Okay, so you probably make 160 a year between overtime and her 10 grand, give or take. Um, and you got seventy yeah, thousand dollars, and you got seventy thousand dollars in debt. So how fast does seventy go away, making 160? Pretty fast. Yeah. You guys should, have should. any money in the bank? They should. You got any money saved? I do, yeah. So I have uh, right now we we have twenty two thousand um, dollars saved. Perfect. You're gonna apply that to your debt snowball. You just knocked out a truck payment right there, man. Yeah, you got rid of the eleven thousand and got well on your way on the next one down. So yeah, just get in. Let's just get in gear, man. Let's get after it. Uh, you're gonna be debt free by Christmas if you'll load this up and get after it. Um, that's plus or minus keeping the dirt bike. Thirteen thousand yeah, dollar dirt bike that's a nice one this is the ramsey show hey it's george camel if you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the ramsey baby steps go to ramseysolutions.com and click on the get started button we'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation that's ramseysolutions.com and click get started Headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting for the pods, moving and storage studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. Annie in Spokane, Washington starts this hour. Hi, Annie. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, thank you so much for taking my call. Sure, what's up? Yeah, so my husband and I have a slight disagreement, and it's, the question is, should we pay our mortgage off and empty our savings account um, or keep a loan for about 150000 and then do a few home improvements, and that would be a new foundation, windows, and HVAC system? Okay, so how much is in savings? 
Uh, right now, we have 608000 in savings. Okay. And the balance on your mortgage is what? 600000 Okay. You said 608000 Co- Correct. It would leave us about a month and a half to two months worth of emergency fund if we pay off our mortgage. You have an emergency fund in addition to the six hundred and eight. No, oh, the eight thousand. No, the eight thousand is a month and a half. I got you. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And your household income is what? At two hundred and three, approximately about two hundred and three thousand. Um, and then also we do have we're just signing a ten year lease for um, some farm ground, and that will bring in um, thirty thousand a year for ten years. Okay, so you have a t- quarter million dollar income, and. Um, mm-hmm. All right. We do not tell people to pay off debt and leave less than three months of expenses. Okay. So let's fast forward from today a couple of months, and now you've got 630000 Okay? Mm-hmm. Uh, that day, I would pay off my mortgage. Okay. And then I'm going to use this fabulous income. And the extra six thousand dollars a month to build up some little uh, buckets of money to do these renovations that we want to do. <laughs> okay. Yep. My husband, uh, he said that's what you'd say, but. <laughs> well, I'm fairly predictable. I've said it over and over and over. I say <laughs> yeah, the same thing all yeah, the time. Yeah. So, I mean, you can. You, yeah. You know. yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, the other thing you can do, it'll help you with this, Annie, to process it. It helps me when you actually put numbers to it and then you put uh how many months it's going to take me to do this so i'm going to go ahead and get like a bid on the heat and air Mm -hmm. i'm going to get a bid on the foundation i'm going to get a bid on what was the other thing windows windows okay yeah and then i'm going to say okay the first one of these we're going to do is i'll make it up windows okay and the bid is thirty thousand dollars Okay, without a house payment and a quarter of a million dollar income, then how quick do I have $30,000 in addition to my emergency fund? Oh, just a couple mm-hmm. months, I mean. Got it, yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then how quick do I have, you know, the, I'll make it up $20,000 for the heat and air, if that's the second one. I don't care which one's first, I'm making this up, okay? But my yeah. point is prioritize and put actual dollars to it and then back into how many months. And what you're going to discover is probably by this time next year, You've got a fully renovated, paid-for house. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. So we're really not discussing, oh, we're never going to get around to this. No, lay it out. Yeah. Game plan it. <laughs> Develop a detailed strategy. And then that, if I'm in your shoes, because you're the one not wanting to pay it off, you're the one wanting to do the renovations first. And that's okay. But if I'm you, then having that game plan going, oh, it's going to be here in a minute anyway. I can deal with that. Yeah. It yeah. helps me to release it. Help, yeah. Yeah, we're yeah. talking about a month or two before you guys have, you know, six twenty five in that account, and now we can clear that mortgage payment, which frees up the mortgage payment on top of still having an emergency fund there. So, it's not enough yeah. time to even argue about. Yeah, it's it, you're going to be there, and, and and you know, I would. You guys make a lot of money, and I would do the renovations, assuming you're not overbuilding the neighborhood with all that. But I, I'm guessing that you're probably going to spend well less than a hundred thousand dollars on those three items. And it sounds like the house is probably north of a million in value. And so it's not a big deal. And you make plenty of money to do all this. So really good job. Very, very good job. These are the good things to argue about. These are good arguments. Okay. It's like, oh, we have $600,000 in savings. Do we pay off the house? What an argument most yeah, people would like to have. Listeners right? are shaking their fists right now going, really? This is this is what we're calling in about. <laughs> 600 grand in the bank. <laughs> Amazing job. <laughs> Truly first world problems. But yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, but the point is you guys are, neither one of you are really wrong. It's just a matter of laying out a strategy to do this. And George, I did this many years ago. We were uh, just coming out of being broke. We we're starting to get a little money finally. We weren't nearly to the point that Annie is at this at this stage. But we had a little bit of money coming in. And Sharon had this, uh, we had little kids. And we had this god awful two tone blue Astro van. Do you remember those? Oh yeah, nasty looking little vehicle, and it was nasty inside because it had had three dogs and three kids in it. It's and seen some things. You talk about stuff. I mean, nuclear waste was in the floorboard. So, 
And this thing was bad. And Sharon's like, gets this idea. Now we're starting to get a little margin. She's like, I need a Suburban. I need a new car. And I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, you know, Santa Claus needs reindeer too, but we're, you know, we're not, it's no, not gonna we're not, happen. yeah, I, I'm work doing stuff down at the office. I got, I got an investment I need to make down here to get some more money coming in by doing this thing. And I, you know, we got 20,000 bucks and we can either buy her a suburban or we can go use that 20,000 down here at the office and make some more money. And, um, you know, and we went at it as if. If she got the Suburban, I would never do the investment. Or if I did the investment, she would never get the Suburban. And what we learned was what we just taught Annie, which is, oh, shut up. Both are going to happen. Both are going to happen fairly quickly. Just decide which one's first. And Flip a coin. Being the wise husband that I am, she got the Suburban first. And then I did the investment second. But it, it really, I mean, we about we had a big old fight about it. Mm. Because we, it was all or nothing, and it's not all or nothing. Usually, it's just it's not no, it's not now. No is not really what we're saying. We're saying not now. We're not really saying no. We're not going to do the heat and air and the windows and the foundation. It's not now. That's the thing. And uh, it's so, kind of like how children are when they go. Well, if it's not going to happen now, I'm going to throw a giant fit because it's never going to happen. Yeah, and that's not what. It's just which one's first. Do we pay off the house or do we do the renovations? It's not an either or. We're going to do both. Let's just decide the order and which one makes the most sense mathematically and emotionally and relationally and all that, right? So there you go. I tried to Google a photo, just this picture Dave and Sharon Ramsey driving no, around. No, that's not it. This two tone. That's, that's not. That's. It's, Are no, we getting that closer? That one's nicer. We're getting closer. That one's nicer. There no, it is. No, that's the. That's still, you still didn't get it. That's going to be that, a new that's segment. That's a full size van there, but yeah. Jordan, Jordan. That's going to be your next car. That's closer, but it, it was a lot uglier than that. That one's a pretty good looking van. Hey, drive like no one else. And later, you can drive anything you want. There you go, babe. Wow. There you go. Hmm. This is the Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us, America. We're glad you're here. Open phones at 888-825-5225. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Thank you for being with us. 888-825-5225. Our Building Wealth Live Tour continues February the 16th. That sounds suspiciously like, what, next week oh, we'll be in Indianapolis week tomorrow. with uh, Rachel Cruz, George Camel, Jade Warshaw. And then we're heading over to Austin, Texas the next week with Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney, and Jade Warshaw. This is me on all of these. April 24th, I'll be heading to Salt Lake City with Rachel Cruz, George Camel, and Christina Ellis. Final stop is Anaheim, May 2nd. Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney, me, and Christina Ellis. Tickets start at $49. You can get a four-pack starting at $175. We'll be signing pictures, answering questions, doing panel discussions, talking about building wealth in 2023 it sounds weird out there right now but you can actually win at money and you can build wealth in the middle of this craziness that we call the united states today it can still be done our question of the day comes from teresa in georgia george take it teresa is asking can you all explain how you think about home improvement loans to increase the size of your house versus buying a bigger home that is more expensive Logically, I do not understand how it's different to increase your mortgage versus taking on a home loan so you do not have to move. I think your advice would be to increase mortgage and move versus taking on a home equity loan, but I don't understand how it's different, both mathematically and logically. I have no debt but my house, and I have a fully funded emergency fund. Interesting. So she's saying, hey, I have a home. Why not just take the HELOC and do home improvements versus moving and buying a bigger home? Well, number one, home improvements usually can be cash flowed. 
Uh, and so she's right in that regard. Now, if you're going to do a $200,000 improvement, you're going to add a wing to this thing, okay? Uh, that's something most people can't cash flow. In that case, you might take out a loan and then refinance and have a permanent mortgage in place when you're done. Uh, however, what normally happens in a situation like that is you're making another mistake, which is you're overbuilding the neighborhood. And if you become the most expensive house on the neighborhood with a weird $200,000 wing, you're not going to get your money back out of it. The home value didn't increase by two hundred grand, is what you're saying. Because the neighborhood is limiting it. So let's say you're in a um, neighborhood that run, runs three to $400,000, and your home is currently worth 300000 and you put an improvement on it of 200000 You now have to get 500000 in a neighborhood that people don't look for $500,000 homes. They're looking for three or $400,000 homes in that neighborhood. They don't, if they got 500000 they don't come to your neighborhood. Uh, and so, plus your house at that point, unless you're an incredible remodeler, an incredible architect, you generally are building a weird structure. I mean, when you start doing stuff like that. So, uh, you know, we need a, our family is growing and we need another, you know, we need some more rooms. You very often run into the situation where you're overbuilding the neighborhood, but that's a different problem than, Logically, I don't understand the difference. So if you were doing a something that's just out of range of cash flow and you're not overbuilding the neighborhood, uh, you know, you're, you're still going to be the, uh, not the most expensive home in the area and you're not building a weird structure, you're not messing up in another way, uh, and, and you were to refinance a home equity loan uh, after you did this into uh, a permanent mortgage, and one mortgage, then there is no difference. And I'm, we're not against that. But I got to tell you, the number of times that happens that you don't end up violating one of these other things is so small. Usually a bad decision is made somewhere here in the process. Yeah. And, and the, you know, basically, you know, I, I emotionally don't want to move. I don't want to leave this area, but I want a house that's bigger than this area supports and has more uh, attributes than this area supports value wise. And, and so, you know, what we're usually doing is kicking you out for your own good and putting you into a neighborhood that fits your new needs. And, you know, but mathematically, logically, yeah, it, it sometimes could work and we're not against you doing that. But, um, but, you know, let's say you're doing a $20,000 rehab and you make a hundred thousand. Well, just shut up and budget it. I mean, save up the money and do it. That's not that's within that's within cash flow reach. Yeah, it's not worth going. And backwards. you wouldn't move up twenty thousand dollars in house either. So that's not part of her. It's not one of her examples. It wouldn't fit with her example. So mm. good question. Home improvements too Fair, much HGTV. But I mean, it's a good clarification that she brings. I like it. Tim mm -hmm. is in Pittsburgh. Hey Tim, what's up? Uh, thanks for taking my call. Sure. My question is at uh, at the age of sixty nine. Does it make sense to backdoor a Roth IRA? If you're going to leave the money alone. If you're going to backdoor it and turn around and take it out the front door, no. Okay, yeah, this is, this is money that I'll probably never need. Exactly. You're going to leave it as an inheritance. And if you, leave, if you, yeah. if you live, you know, 10, 20 years, 79, 89 which you're very likely to do unless you're unhealthy right now, uh, statistically you are anyway, uh, then, okay, then you're going to, you're going to, you're going to have, you're going to be really glad. Plus the Roth IRA now does not require RMD does not require, uh, required minimum distributions at 73, like a traditional does. Okay. So you're able to now, just leave it for, there. for assistance. Would I go to a, uh, you know, a tax person or no, you go to one of our smart investor advice. No, you go to an investment broker, one of our uh, advisors that we recommend. They don't work for us, but they're called smart investor pros. And they're people in the mutual fund and business, and they'll help you get one open and help you do the back door and uh, run that out. So, but the math works out that if you're going to leave it alone 10 plus years, the Roth go comes out ahead. And it sounds like you're going to leave it alone that long. Uh, and cause you don't have to touch it at 73 because it's not, there's no RMDs anymore on that. No required minimum distributions, the new secure 
Act. And by the way, that SECURE Act uh, is, there's a big blog on it, the SECURE 2.0 Act. It's a big blog at RamseySolutions.com, and you can read that blog post and learn a lot about. It did a lot of interesting things to retirement, and almost all of it's good. Mm. A few weird things, but uh, we got it. We have a really good thorough article on that. But, um, but so, and what's a backdoor Roth IRA? So this is a great tool when you want to maximize your wealth and the traditional IRA has income limits. And so if you are at a point where you've maxed out a lot of these retirement tax advantaged accounts, you can open up a traditional IRA, you can max that out, and then you convert those funds to Roth, meaning you pay the taxes at that point, but then you never pay them again. Yeah. So actually, you you open an after tax, traditional, after tax traditional Roth and IRA. instantaneously roll it to a Roth IRA. I do one every year, um, and I'm I'll be 63 this year, so I keep doing them. And uh, for those that go, well, when do I do this in the process? Only do this once you're kind of at baby step seven yeah, with yeah. a paid for house. If you got a big tax implication, I'd rather see those funds used to pay off your mortgage versus yeah. convert the funds. If your household income is over 200 thousand, you don't qualify for Roth IRA anymore. And so the only way you can get a Roth IRA is open an after-tax traditional and roll it to a Roth. And uh, it's actually a, a weird little loophole in the law, and they've never figured out a way to close it. So They threatened it. it. There was some threats, and people got uh, spooked, but they haven't done anything. Yeah, that, uh, it, don't, it won't matter. It's completely it, won't, it won't go back and undo the ones we've already done. It just won't be able to do it going forward if they ever stop it up. But for now, that loophole is there, and that works for those of you making more than 200000 If you're at the point that you – want to put more into retirement. And George said, normally that's a baby step seven that you're trying to get there and do that. So I do anything I can do to keep the government's hands off of money. Because if you haven't noticed, they're stupid. They're stupid. And we don't want to give the stupid people money. So anything that's legal, keep their hands off of it. Because I don't want to give stupid people money. They're stupid. Well, is, is it tax great time? At spending. Is my tax time passive aggressive nature? I mean, aggressive aggressive nature coming out. Dave gets grouchy I I every I April. I don't have a passive aggressive nature. I'm aggressive aggressive. Oh, they're stupid. You're like Punxsutawney Dave. Six more weeks of grouchiness they're until tax season's stupid. over. Stupid. This is the Ramsey Show. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today in the lobby of Ramsey Solutions on the debt-free stage. Kevin and Sherry are with us. Hey, guys. How are you? How are you? Welcome. Where do y'all live? We're out of Denver, Colorado. <laughs> Denver. Yes. Welcome to Nashville. Thank you, sir. And how much debt have you guys paid off? Uh, I was in a little over 98000 in uh, about 22 months. Wow. And your range of income during that two years? Uh, we're about 155 to about 210 Wow. Good for you. What do you all do for a living? Um, I'm in the uh, IT networking space. I work for a uh, large uh, investment and banking firm. Cool. And I worked for Hobby Lobby during that time. Oh, great. Yep. Very good. Good for you guys. Well, well done. What kind of debt was the 98000 Uh Just as you say, everything uh, kind of normal. Some credit card debt, a couple vehicles, uh, home improvement stuff that uh, we obviously didn't pay for in cash. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so, yeah, normal stuff. There you go. You were normal. <laughs> yeah. And how long y'all been married? Uh, 23 years. Yeah. So Yo. after 23 years of marriage, after 21 years of marriage, you're sitting here with normal amounts of debt. What was the wake-up call? How'd you get onto this Ramsey stuff? Go ahead. So actually, I wanted to do this way back about probably 20 years ago when we kind of, our kids were first born. And Come on, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> slow, uh, slow learner. We, um, I actually had, had a friend introduce me to Financial Peace University and she actually shared her CDs with me, let me listen to it. I was like, let's do this. I bought envelopes. I started it. And every time he would be like, oh, he'd go spend money. I'm like, that's not in the budget. What are you doing? And he was, I don't know. I don't want to do this. So we actually went through some marital issues and 
that really kind of yeah. got us some got us going so yeah. yeah i'll let him finish the rest yeah, so we went through <laughs> those problems and she had even moved moved out of the house and you know pretty pretty rough times and wow. As we uh, started working on that and all the other, you know, other problems we had, this was, you know, finances was one of them, and mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was I was on board, right? We uh, gotta get gotta get our marriage right, so uh, we we did that, and it's been uh, full bore ever since. Good for you. Thank you. That's incredible. Yeah, you, you said uh, it's wh whatever. I got it. We, whatever it takes yeah. to do the marriage right. Yeah. And being on the same page on the money is one of the elements. Yeah. And I want to put this together and I'm going to sacrifice my uh, my pride yeah. and go do that. I, I was I good mean, for you. That's it. Right. Is good the pride. for you. Very, well, it's all of us. I mean, yeah. we're all do that. Yeah. Good for you, so, though. Yeah. Thank that, you. That's really manning up. I'm proud of you. Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> it. Very cool. I was hollering at you a minute ago. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> so what did this financial transformation look like when you said, all right, I'm willing to do whatever it takes. What's next? Really, it was him taking over the finances. So I used to do all the bill paying and stuff like that. And so he kind of took it over and he created a budget and then started listening to you guys and was like, okay. Was your mind just blown when you saw him sitting down doing the budget himself? Yes. And then now he usually gets upset with me because he's like, why don't you look at the budget with me? <laughs> I'm like, I don't care. Just tell me what Tables I have. Tables have turned. <laughs> yes, wow. Exactly. This is a complete turn. <laughs> exactly. yeah, I, I finally applied the uh, engineering uh, job, you know, thinking in mind to, to that. And now I probably overdo it. I'm, I'm in my budget sheet daily so <laughs> yeah well i mean it's a formula and yeah. it's a process that works yes yeah. and that's what engineering is yeah. and so it's a na it is a natural way for your brain to work yes yeah. it, it does line up with that that's funny and now it's completely turned around and you're like would you get in here and do the budget yeah, yeah. <laughs> totally yeah but and, and it really has helped our marriage a ton yeah. just i mean i can't express that enough like yeah. i didn't feel like the finances were pro part of our problem or the main part of our problem but just that communication and working through the finances together yeah. well, really a lot, of, a lot of marriage counselors use getting a couple on a that are having marriage trouble on a budget because it's not about the budget it's about where your money goes yeah is your dreams it's your values it's yeah. your fears yeah. and so it's when you're you're agreeing on your life when you're agreeing on your money it's not that the the money problem but the fact that you weren't agreeing on your money is you weren't agreeing on the yeah. other uh, stuff too yeah. yes <laughs> uh, and I, I mean we we always knew we were blessed to make what we made and mm -hmm. uh but yeah where where's it going how you know and for us it was we'd end every year and i'd get a bonus and we'd pay off debt and then a few months into the year we'd already start with that so yeah it's, well i don't know who did your marriage counseling but they did a great job you look like a couple of newlyweds <laughs> I'm impressed. You said 23 years married. I was like, wow. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, you look like it's all fresh and new. and That's, that's cool. cool. For the last couple of years, yeah, it just kind of feels okay. that way. Yeah, and the 22 months of getting out of debt correlates with the healing yeah. uh, of and you moving back in and all that, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, wow. Yep. That is powerful, guys. Thank you. So we're, we're a, a, a little piece of the story of an awesome story um, about a marriage being redeemed yep. mm. or Absolutely. walking in here I, I said it to 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 sheree it's uh like uh you know meeting some some friends because i listen to you every day and so it's like oh wow, it's cool to see you guys and, yeah. and meet you so just us yeah <laughs> just exactly we're, we devastatingly exactly what you expect <laughs> Yeah. So. Oh my goodness. So Sherry, this was a 20 year journey for you. It's a little bit newer for Kevin. Was there a thing that the knob turned when you went, I listened to the show, I read the book, I went to financial peace. What was the thing for you where you went light bulb on? I've got it. You mean when I, like before? When Kevin finally got on board 20 years later, <laughs> was there a thing that he connected to where he went, that's it, I, I get it now? I or was it just the rock I, bottom moment of the marriage? I think that was it. I think yeah. it was that. I think that he was not willing to give up and I wasn't willing to give up either, but we just couldn't figure it out. And that was the, that was the thing we needed was to get on board on that. Mm -hmm. So it made a big difference for us. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we had kids very young, uh, even before we were married and maybe that's where some of the, you know, things, you know, started wrong, but, um, of course having our kids w wasn't wrong, but, um, you know, then looked at it and thought, gosh, we have so much life ahead of us, right? And we, I want to enjoy the things that we've worked hard to enjoy and have been blessed with. And, you know, that was a big part of it, too. I want to... You had I'll, a vision for your life. Yeah, maybe I want to enjoy time. it with my friend, right? My best friend, my mm -hmm. wife, so...
Yeah. That's awesome. And who were your biggest cheerleaders on this journey? <laughs> really? We did it? I, yeah. It sounds we, weird. We really did on our own. Most people in our life were naysayers, kind of like, this is not, why are you, yeah, you know? Yeah. And kind of like, even like, why are you doing that a lot? We got that. Like, yeah. you know, I would say something to someone in my family and they'd be like, I don't know why you're doing that. Like, that's crazy. Like, why? So we kind of just got on board we and just made it. it work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, uh, enough trying to get anybody to be positive. We'll just move on. Yeah. 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 Exactly. That's good. Good yeah. for y'all. Thank you. How's it feel now that you're free? Amazing. Uh, yeah, it really is. It's what do you true. tell people the key to getting out of debt is? Uh, I mean, Dave, for me, it's a few things, right? But it, it's um, being a, a Latino man, um, you know, not listening to the narratives that are out there and, and uh, you know, hard work. What our parents, my, you know, my folks, Cherie's folks, hard work, honesty, um, you know, doing what you need to do and that's got us to where we are and so that's the key right that discipline and uh what you teach is is that discipline and, and stability so yeah. that's that's the key to me yeah, yeah. way to go you guys way thank to you. go hey we got the live and give bundle for you that's the thank total you. money makeover book thank you the baby steps millionaires book and a one-year membership to financial peace university Thank you. Uh, you can go through it. You can give it away. Maybe other people are inspired by your overall story and the money part of it. You can help them with by handing them one of those things. So Thank you. That's good, awesome. Good job, man. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are neat. Thank you. You're Thank fun. You. Thank you. You're fun. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> we appreciate very, it. Very, very well done. Kevin and Cherie, Denver, Colorado. 98000 paid off in 22 months, making 155 to 210 Oh, and they saved their marriage. Count it down. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, two one. one. We're, We're debt free. free. Yeah. yeah. Woo -hoo. This is how it's done. What a journey. It took 23 years to decide to do something for 22 months that set them up Whoa. for freedom. Interesting. I mean, it's just wild when you think about it that way. Are you willing to sacrifice for just this much time or do you want to suffer for the next decade or two? In mediocrity, you get to decide. This is The Ramsey Show. of the day John 832 then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free Sojourner Truth said truth is powerful and it prevails is that a person that name that's it weird sounds okay. sounds right I feel like I've heard that before okay what do I know all right uh George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today Ron is with us in Philadelphia hey Ron welcome to the Ramsey show Hey guys, thanks for taking my call. Sure. How can we help? Um, well, <clears throat> uh, about coming up on two years now, I came out of a divorce, had to sell the home, moved back in with my parents. Um, it's getting kind of uh, long that uh, finding a home. Uh, I've completed the first three of your baby steps after finding your total money makeover book and reading it front to back. Uh, pretty quick and uh i just want to know if i should just like put everything into the savings for a down payment on a home or should I, or if i should do four five and six like you suggest okay we also suggest baby step 3b in the total money makeover do you remember that uh vaguely off the top of my head is just uh i yeah 
Okay. So three B is where you would save up for a down payment. You already have the emergency fund. You have no debt. And so you can really focus in for, you know, a few years to save up that down payment. And if you want to invest, you know, we people invest from zero to 15 percent while doing that. It just depends on how aggressive you want to be in getting that house. So I have about 40000 saved for a down payment. And I'm just it's it's been two years and I'm just trying to was start a new life with a new woman in my life and so just get out there and be a family again so I'm are you renting right now like the, no i i live rent free with my family so i mean it's great it's helping me so much that i can put four to six thousand dollars a month away in savings it's just how old are you like daunting like i'm 37 okay and what do you make a year uh, without overtime, probably seventy. This past year, I made about a hundred. Okay, and you have forty thousand dollars cash, and you live in your parents' house at thirty-seven years old. Yeah. Okay. Go rent an apartment or go buy a house. I don't care uh, which. If you're not ready to get the house, then I'm renting while continuing to save up the down payment. And don't buy a house with the new woman in your life unless you're married to her. Gotcha. Because you're going to get yourself in another mess, okay? Um, so, uh, you know, if, if you want to wait until you're married and then the two of you go pick out the house, then you would rent an apartment. Does that make sense? Yes. But I think it's going to be great for you, the relationship with her, uh, everything, just to get on out of there. You've done a great job. You've gotten on your feet, and you're feeling um, antsy. You're feeling the need to jump from the nest. And so... Uh, Uncle Dave's going to push you. Fly and be free. Rachel's with us in St. Louis. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi. Thank you so much for taking my call. I'm super excited. I am a homeschool mom of a sophomore daughter, and we are doing the um, Foundation University personal finance class through the Ramsey Network. Very cool. Love it. Oh, my gosh. Awesome class. And we just watched Borrowed Future George. So thank you very much for that. You're your teacher's pet today. Love Yay! It. So my daughter is starting her first job at 16, and the personal finance class and the, the joys of compound interest has really caught her attention. And I would like to help her find some type of high-yield account that she can start with. Um, and I, I have no idea where to start. And so I was hoping you could maybe make a suggestion for something online that would be safe and appropriate for a 16-year-old. Okay. Sorry, are you wanting her to just save up a pile of cash for her next goal, like a car or college education? Yes. She is actually, we have her college education saved for um, through 529 um, because she is going to do a state school and do school smart with scholarships and in-state tuition. And so with that, we are good. So this money would be for probably life after college to start her life. Okay, so she's intrigued with the with the uh, the compound interest tables and the understanding of Jack and Blake and all that kind of stuff, and she sees that and wants to get that kind of stuff going. Yeah, absolutely. That more than more than I'm trying to book. save up to buy a car in September. Yes, she 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 wants the compound interest. She wants to be a millionaire. Okay, um, all right, that's fun. Okay, so the uh, let me give you the the truth and then i'll tell you what to do to scratch her itch okay the truth is nothing she does right now is going to cause that to happen okay the knowledge that she has if she applies that as she comes out of college starts a family has an adult household income and in her 20s begins to apply the baby steps stays out of debt builds an emergency fund and starts jacking up that 401k and that Roth IRA that's what's going to make her a millionaire probably in her 30s but it's not really going to be that she puts her Chick-fil-a income working at Chick-fil-a into a something at 17 that's really not what's going to get her there but I want her to do it anyway okay okay so now that we've established this is not going to make her a millionaire but instead the knowledge is going to make her a millionaire later then that changes our the pressure of this now what we're really doing is not a an investment for the sake of building wealth we're doing an investment as an object lesson 
from the homeschool. So she can actually see the practical thing happen that she studied, and that scratches her itch as well. It gets her started. But the truth is she's not going to put enough money in there at this age to become a millionaire unless she's some kind of wonder child or something. You know, she's (laughs) what is she doing for work? Um, she's working at a local ice rink. Yeah, she's going to so, be a learn to skate, skate guard type yeah. person. Yeah, skate guard money doesn't make you a millionaire when you're 17, okay? But it, it will help you start a mutual fund, and you can learn how they work, and you'll be way ahead of the curve, which is what happened when you taught her these lessons to start with. She's way ahead of the curve. So just jump online at RamseySolutions.com and click on the Smart Vester Pro in your area. They love teaching teenagers by opening their first mutual fund. And they don't make okay. squat on it. They make $15 on it or something. I mean, it's not because, again, it's not enough money to, to screw with. But it's a great thing because it gets her brain started on this. And then, you know, when she's dating some guy who goes, oh, mutual funds are stupid and I'm going to run up my credit cards. She goes, you're not the one, you know, because we've got this thing laid out. And so what we're doing is the the same thing. We're, we're extending what you've already done at, with the homeschool lessons from foundations. Yeah. But it, it's. You know, what you really do in high school is not what gets you there. It's the things you learn that you apply as you enter adulthood. And it's creating those habits and that muscle that's going to get her there. And there's a lot of things you can do from short-term savings, a high-yield savings account or money market account. You could do the mutual fund and a taxable brokerage. This is an object lesson. I would do a mutual fund. In a taxable brokerage? Yes. Okay. Because there's also custodial Roth IRA, but that's retirement. No, wouldn't do that. I just would open a mutual fund. Just go get Growth Fund of America and or whatever. Put a hundred right? bucks in it, and just well, it takes a thousand to get it open or whatever. But get it open. Learn how to read the statements. Learn how to sit at the desk with the investment advisor, Smart Investor Pro. Learn the lingo. Watch the statement. Watch how the share price goes versus what you hear on the news. What you know, and all, have the emotional experience of all of that. But that thousand dollars or that two thousand dollars that goes in there from ice rink guard money is, again, not going to be the cause mathematically of your wealth, but you're setting the pattern in your life and the knowledge base in your life that is going to cause that. And what a great parent. I know. Absolutely. Man. What great parenting. Rachel, you're a star. You're amazing. Well done. That puts us out of the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter.